All right. Thank you again. This is another episode of My Creative Journey with your host, Mark Bird. Right. We have another amazing podcast with my homie, Anthony Pittman in the building. You know what I'm saying? Painting it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, oh, I did say your name already, but can you please say your name? Well, yeah. What's up? My name is Anthony, uh, a.k.a. Anthony XYZ without the O. Okay. Um, but yeah, local Compton artist, muralist, painter. Dope, dope, dope. That's and I, I was just about to ask you, like, yo, so where are you from now? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, where are you from? Yeah, That's well, you know I gotta stay repping Compton. Oh, CPT all day. <laughs> Compton, oh, where'd you get that that uh shirt? Who's that by? Uh Compton Life Clothing. Oh, that's dope. Classic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Compton that's by fire. nature. Yeah, yeah. I gotta get one of those. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I, I ain't from here, but you know, this actually is recorded in the city of Compton, by the way. See what I'm saying? You could definitely show up, show out. Um, another, I, I just want to get into like you, your creative journey, how you ended up being a painter, like that whole entire idea. And, and since you actually touched on Compton first, mm. you know what I'm saying? So how is that like you being a painter and being from Compton? Mm, I mean, I think it's expected, right? That a lot of folks from here are creative and have some type of like talent, right? Because that's like our history. Okay. But um, as far as like being a painter, um, I always felt like it was kind of different from like what most folks do, you know, aside from like sports or music or film. Um, but um, like as I get older and start learning more of the history of our city, I, I feel a lot more connected to like the city's history because of the amount of painters that have come through here, mm. like Elliot Pinckney and um, Charles Dixon. He's more of a sculpture artist, but that legacy of artists that have existed here for years, mm -hmm. um, it's like an unknown history almost, you know? So getting to become familiar with that, I feel like I'm kind of like continuing that legacy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, um, but yeah, it feels good to create and be from Compton and yeah, rep my city. You rep your city? <laughs> you rep your city? So how, um, okay, so what's your nationality, if you don't mind asking? I'm, uh, I'm mixed. So I'm black and Mexican. Okay, for sure, for sure. So um, I moved here from the East Coast, right? And usually, you know, like at least from, it's like East Coast and the South because I grew up in Virginia, but then I grew up as a, an adult in New York City Then I moved here. And when I was in Virginia, like, a lot of my friends were Mexican and from El Salvador. Like, a lot of them, right? So, and then I got here, and everybody's like, yo, that's a big separation, right? So, like, in terms of black and brown, like, I don't, I don't know what took place and things like that, because, again, I wasn't here. But had that, has the divide, I guess, or the things that played out here in the city ever, like, changed your your point of view of like being creative or like trying to fit figure out where you fit in mm. yeah i think it took me years to find like my I, I guess they call it like a niche right like that thing that identifies you as an artist okay and um ultimately i i use that like that identity of me being black and Mexican and, and put it in my work. So like when you see my work, you'll see like references to Mexican culture, but also black culture. Um, I also grew up in in a Mexican household, like my grandmother raised me okay, pretty much. And she was like hardcore Mexican Catholic. So like I had to do my first communion and all that. Um, and I really loved looking at the work in, in church, you know, because, you know, Catholic Mass is it's quick, but it, it don't feel quick. Uh, so when I was a kid, I would just sit and stare at all the sculptures, the paintings and and all of that. And, and that's what really, I think, sparked my inspiration now um, looking back. So you'll see like references to like the saints or like some type of like. I like to incorporate halos in my artwork as well. So like I used, um, you know, black figures, but also like those elements for me growing up as like a black Mexican um, and put those influences in my work too. Dang, you know, I never knew that because um, I have a piece that's mm -hmm. sitting on the wall back there of Khalif Browder and I never 
you know, like put two and two together that that came from your grandmother. Mm -hmm. That that stemmed from there. Yeah. That's deep. Yeah, no, because, you know, uh, Mexican Catholics are very like, oh, you know, you got to talk to the saints, pray to the saints. Or, you know, we have like those calendars with the saints on them. Yeah. Or like the Virgen of Guadalupe. Like that's, you know, everywhere, like outside of the carnicerias and stuff. Um, So like I just took, taking like black folks and then you know replacing that like uh figure of the saints which come from you know like the spanish colonizers and mm. sort of taking out that that figure and replacing it with with black folks so it's kind of like a a mesh of the catholic imagery but also like celebrating blackness and like these different identities that exist within uh the black diaspora Mm. yeah that's dope <laughs> that, i'm just thinking like hey let's deep like and the reason why I, um, i'm pondering on it too because i um i remember in 2020 when you were painting your grandmother mm -hmm. you know what i mean just in the other room and you know seeing how much influence she had on you mm. you know that that took me back to that moment you know what i mean yeah yeah and i mean my grandma was a huge part of me growing up um i like to think of her like my dad in a way because like she was like the strict one she was like always making sure that we were like doing what we were supposed to do you know like and my mom was always very like a mom i'm a mama's boy too you know okay. so like i love my mom and and we definitely have had our like special relationship but my mom my grandma was more of like the you better be doing this and like getting me on check and yeah. you know what i mean making sure that i was like not slacking so yeah my, my grandma was a huge part of me um first of all having like a drive to want to do something that'll like um not only fulfill me um as an artist but will also like help me make some money you know and yeah and bring in you know stuff to the house that'll take care of all of us uh the way that my grandma took care of us so Nah, that's that's dope, man. That's really cool. I um, yeah, man. Yeah, shout out to your grandmother because I when I was growing up, and I think that's why like I'm still deeply invested. I remember the conversations that my grandmother having with me, and uh, she's still alive. She lives in uh, Virginia, um, and she would take us to church. I remember every Wednesday, man. Oh my God, we would <laughs> be there, you know, and every Sunday and things like that. And then also praying around the food on Thanksgiving and those little traditions mm -hmm. that now I carry on, you know, for, for my kids. And mm -hmm. hopefully my kids continue it on because they're they're so special to mm -hmm. me now, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and who else? Because um, I was going to say, I feel like you answered the questions before I'm asking. <laughs> right. Um, but I was going to say, who else was a, a deep influence on who you are like as an as a creator uh you mean like personally like personally. in my life uh well i mean my other grandparents too right uh they were a huge inspiration as well like learning their story and them migrating from the south to to what part uh my grandma's from baton rouge and they're my, creole uh i don't think so but people okay. always ask me <laughs> yeah, they, they asked you that? Yeah. Oh, that's dope. Um, and my uh, grandpa's from Princess, Mississippi, small town. Um, yeah? Yeah, but they uh, migrated to Willowbrook uh, back in, like, the 60s. Um, and they met, actually, in Willowbrook. So, um, you know, like, hearing their story, too, and, like, all the crazy stuff that they went through and seeing the city evolve... Um, to where it is now and like living that history of like you know what was essentially like the the start of this black uh demographic in LA um I mean that was really inspiring too and you know just I, I've always loved you know learning about their life and what it was like for them so they were a huge part of um you know my work and and I try to like incorporate some of those uh, themes into my work as well. Like some of those stories, I guess. Mm -hmm. Like, so what was it? Was it an opportunity when they got here? What was it? How did they get here? You know what I mean? Like, I try to imagine that. 
like how, you know, you know, going to the north in the sense with like northwest. What was it like the trains? Like what was it like? Well, day, the warehouses? When, my, when my grandma moved out here, she was young. She was because my grandparents got married when she was 15. So she was a girl when, when she moved out here. Um, mm -hmm. So she mainly came with her parents. Um, but yeah, they they lived in the Willowbrook area. Um, they worked in in the area too. Uh, you know, it was kind of segregated uh, back then. Kind of. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Watson, Compton, and and Willowbrook were blocked off in a, in a way that like you couldn't really find any opportunities outside of the area. What year was this? Um, I mean, this was around the time of the Watts riots. Uh, Post Watts okay. right? so like after the six mid sixties. Oh yeah, yeah. So Compton was available, but before I thought you was gonna say the fifties. I'm like, what? She came out here <laughs> in the fifties. She must have had money. Yeah, Compton was nothing to play with. Yeah, no. But um, yeah. I mean, just you know, hearing their stories, not really about their like professional lives or anything, but like the relationships that they were able to build with other folks who were migrating here, yeah. and um, hearing stories of them kind of like being raised with other families or other kids and. Um, them getting into trouble or, you know, being wild and young like they were. But, um, yeah, I mean, just like reliving those those memories that they would tell me about and going through like photos, too. I love um, pulling like old pictures and like uh, drawing them or like painting them um, just to like create that that. Um, how would you say like to. To let it live, like, for a really long time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And not just have, like, these stack of photos that are in a photo album somewhere. You know what I mean? And, and making, like, some art out of it. Um, and kind of paying homage to my family's history and, and the legacy that, that we've built. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. So when did you know that, like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a painter. Like, what age? Uh, I mean, I don't... I always wanted to be a an artist, but it, it just felt like something that was unattainable or like art could only be a like a side hustle or like a hobby. OK. Um, but it's interesting the way that I actually became a professional artist because I was kind of met with these really big opportunities mm -hmm. um, before I could actually say like, oh, this is definitely something that could work for me. Um, but I, I remember being 15. Um, and I got a really big commission with uh, Jenny Rivera, who is uh, like a really famous Mexican recording yeah. artist. Did she pass away? Yeah, she passed away. You met her? Yeah, and I got to meet her and do a painting for her for this exhibit that one of my homegirls' moms was uh, putting together at the YWCA. Yeah. Um, and Jenny Rivera was the, um, she was like the, the guest speaker, right? Like the honorary speaker for, for this event. And... Um, my homegirl's mom knew that I, like I was into art and that I like to draw and stuff, so she connected me with Jenny Rivera to do this painting. And I remember I was under, I felt like I was under a lot of pressure because I was like, man, like I gotta do this painting. It's probably gonna be like on TV or something. And and I, I kind of freaked out. Um, and that's when I was introduced to uh, Cleveland Palmer. Cleveland Palmer, I don't know who that is. He's the 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 studio art teacher at Compton High School. Okay. Yeah. And um, I had asked for some help because I was like, you know, feeling the pressure of like trying to get this painting. It was a huge painting too, like 36 by 48, like some big like that. Um, and he kind of like stepped me through, you know, walked me through the steps of like how to create a portrait and like to think about the colors and, and th these different elements to put into it. Um, and then I started taking his AP class the following year okay. in 11th grade. Um, and he would like, you know, take us to portfolio days and to go to like these uh, art schools and to check it out and show our work and stuff. And, uh, he really like motivated us to not monetize on our art, but to see it as, as a, a form of income like to actually support ourselves oh crap so i remember he was teaching us to paint some really dope stuff like realistic type portraits um and my old art school teach uh, art teacher from middle school he saw the work that we were doing 
and uh, he saw a painting that I did, and was, he was like, "Nah, you didn't paint that." And I was like, "Yeah, I painted what it." What a hater! <laughs> no, I, I don't think he was hating. He was just more like in this, bro. Um, but he was like, "Man, that that painting's dope, whatever." And and he actually bought the painting off of me because like he loved it. The and, one with, of Ginny. No, it was uh, a different. It sorry, was a sorry. painting of Dorothy Dandridge, and it was like my first oil painting that I ever did. Um, and it was just like a class assignment that that we had uh, that Mr. Palmer had, had given us. Okay. Um, but my middle school art teacher ended up buying that that painting, and I think that's when I realized, like, oh wow, I could actually like make a living doing this. Yeah, make a living doing it. So like that experience of doing the painting for Jenny Rivera, and then also learning how to paint uh, with Mr. Palmer, and and selling my work while I was still in high school. Yeah. And then also doing like the downtown art walks um, when I was still in high school too was also like a big, um, like a an insight to like how far my, my work could really go. So, all right. So there's this thing everyone says, and I know, um, I wish Abigail was here. Uh, you know, shout out to my wife. <laughs> but no, the starving artist. What is that about? Right. I um, that's something that I don't believe in. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I know that uh, like there's this this thing where they say, oh, artists sometimes don't make it until after they die. Mm. So how do you look at that? That's tough, man. Well, I mean, look at all the artists that are living and working now who are like, you know, have their work in museums, you know, looking at like Kehinde Wiley and Carrie James Marshall, um, Amy Sherrill, right? Like all these big name artists. Uh, but I, I feel like that is kind of dying off in the sense that like we have more access to what people are doing. So you get to actually see like artists, paintings around the world from your couch or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, but the starving artist is, I feel like it's true to a certain extent, right? Okay. Like in the beginning, you know, when you are trying to like do something with your work and try to, uh, you know, just get the wheels turning on, on your, your work as like a professional. Um, but I feel, you know, once you start to network and make connections and you stay persistent with your, with your art and your creativity, like you start making a lot more money and you also got to value your work in a way that is um, is just to, you know, the amount of energy and time that it takes to make a, a work. Um, and also just b taking commissions from people who also value your work the way it should be valued and not just yeah. making, you know, $50 or like, you know, some little change for for doing like something that's really good. Um, I think that's also something that kept me going was meeting people who kind of forced me to to see the value in the work that I was doing. Cause I was really, I, my beginning was really like me underselling my work and like mm. not even valuing, not that I didn't value it, but I just didn't see it in a way that like I felt like I could be making what I felt like I deserved. Um, and one moment that like really opened my eyes um, was uh, in 2019, I did a group show in New York. At, oh, where? In New York? At the One Art Space in Tribeca. Tribeca. Ah, oh, yeah, he was down there. Tribeca. Yeah. Uh, we, we Harlem, man. We uptown. <laughs> we uptown. We uptown. Yeah, right. but... Um, I remember I did this group show and I had these two really big paintings and like two smaller ones. And I didn't know what to price my paintings. Like I, I, I just didn't know. I didn't know. I, I had a feeling, you know, what, what it was worth. But as far as like people seeing that worth, I didn't know if it was going to translate. And I remember this girl came up to me. She was an artist that was also showing um, in that group show. And she was like, come with me. Like, let's go look at the, the artworks. Okay. And she was like, pay attention to all the prices that these artists, like, price their work for. And mm -hmm. then go look at yours. And she was like, your, your paintings are the cheapest 
paintings here as far as like the the price but it's like some of the best quality painting that you that's in this gallery and she's like you, you really need to like she was like you know don't be afraid to ask for what you deserve like people are gonna recognize that i think uh sometimes that can um also lead to like our environment mindset mm -hmm. you know from what we see around us and things of that, you know, what we ingest every day. Like we know when we're on Compton Boulevard, what we're gonna see. We're gonna see tire shops because it's potholes. You know what I mean? We're gonna see mechanic shops because we need to fix those. And then we're also gonna, we're gonna see a whole bunch of weed marijuana spots, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? And yeah. there's no, no hate on the weed out here <laughs> at all. You know what I'm saying? But I think that because, you know, from the fast food, everything that we ingest every day, AutoZone, we got like six auto zones mm -hmm. because like people will be messing up their cars out here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Everywhere you go, mm -hmm. you see that. Right. So we don't have, you know, the, you know, the nice things that'll elevate our minds to be like, yo, you know what? I'm more than worth whatever I'm asking for mm -hmm. automatically, you know, and it's, it's unfortunate because we do it to ourselves all the time. We like in uh, understanding the value of our time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, we know, I, I'm looking at a painting, they may can't see it, but this, I'm like, everybody that comes in here, they're like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. They're like, yo, they'll look at this and then they'll look at that. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing on the other side. When they come in to the and they see this mural, they're like, whoa, this is crazy. Yeah. Right? Like, yo, I, yo, this is wild. <laughs> like every time they come in the building. Yeah. And it's because of the level of work, right? And I think, Sometimes we have to, my mentor always says, our price is in our branding. Mm. So if we're branding like a Louis Vuitton, we already know what we're going to pay. Mm. Right? But if you know, you know what I'm saying, you go into the Piggly Wiggly, you know what you're going to pay. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you know the quality is not the same. Mm. Right? So the quality of what you're getting, you have to price it more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it just takes um, experience, too. Like, yes. having to live through all of that to really, like, add more value to not just your work, but your time as an artist and your, you know, what you do as an artist also. Like, living through all types of crazy situations where, like, either I feel like my creative... Um, my, like my creativity isn't being valued or like my my actual work and labor as an artist isn't being valued you know what I mean so like living through situations like that also like was like nah I'm, I'm gonna start charging more like yeah <laughs> heck yeah. yeah like you know sometimes I think um and there's like this hype and there's no there's no disrespect because I love his work but like there's this huge like thing with culture when it comes to Basquiat it's mm. like, oh my God, like it's a Basquiat, right? Mm. And I think it's, I think he's phenomenal, right? And I'm like, yo, I think because Jay-Z mentioned him, it like changed the game or mm -hmm. something. And, um, but when I see some artwork, like I'll be like, man, that's inspired by this person. Or I'm thinking like, not that I would want to compare, but I'm like, yo, I will buy that before I buy that. Mm. Right? Yeah. So... When you view certain pieces, right? What, uh, like, what perspectives do you go to, through at times? Like, when you, let's say, I give you an Ernie Barnes piece, was sold, what, what is it, like, fourteen million? He sold recently, like crazy. So, like, an Ernie Barnes piece, and then you have like a Basquiat. Like, what would you say to someone who's like trying to get into art? Like, what should I be looking for? Uh, I mean. At the end of the day, art is uh, an interpretation of mm -hmm. like whoever's looking at it. And I think we usually attribute our own personal experiences and feelings when we look at work. So, I mean, I, I can't really give anyone any advice as far as like how to look at work. I feel like that's mm -hmm. also a learning process yeah. of just learning the way composition works and color and um, decoding, you know, symbols and icons and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, I could introduce you to artists and, and give you like a list of 
dope artists that I think are like really cool. But um, as far as like teaching folks how to look at it, I, I think, you know, try to understand it from the artist's perspective, but also, I mean, it's a huge, um, you're also putting your, your influence, like I said, in your your personal experiences and, and looking at it through that lens too. So just look at it, you know, with intent, right? Uh, with the intention of trying to understand the work, um, but also trying to figure out like, how does it relate to you? And like, what connection do you have to it? Okay. I like that. I like that perspective a lot. Um, I have, a, I have a, a question, right? One of the questions is, can, like, let's say I purchased a piece, right? From like, like Ernie Barnes piece just sold, right? For 14 million. That's like my, like that, I went in person to Cam and actually mm. saw it. Like me and my daughter, mm. like, I believe it was like, like really small too. We went, I was like, yo, I got to see this piece. Cause I remember seeing it mm. like when I was a kid. You know, and now I get to see it in person. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Since it's sold, it's not in a museum, I, I assume, mm -hmm. right? But can a museum pay me to rent my piece? Is that how does that works? Yeah, like uh, folks will lend. Um, lend? Hold on, hold on. I'm not just lending. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I gotta there's, get paid. Yeah, there's, it's called lending, right? Like you're... You're, you're lending this painting to a, a museum or a gallery from your collection, but they're paying you to use it. Oh, okay. That's what they do. So, all right. I didn't know if they did that. I didn't know if that was a thing. But then my, my thing is like, there's so many people that's out there that paint lookalikes. You may not even get the same painting again. You may not get the original. You know what I'm saying? Like, Mm, I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know if I'm going to get it back. I mean, but it has to be a... Oh, well, you mean like if they do like a switcheroo or yeah. something? Yeah. <laughs> um, they got the original, I don't. I mean, I don't know what to say to that. I've never <laughs> been in that situation, but I hope it don't happen. <laughs> oh, for sure, for sure. But um, so I have a question, right? Uh, I, I know I, I had sent you a couple questions, but one of them is like, who are some of like, the painters that you go to. You said, I can give you a list of dope artists. Mm -hmm. Who are like five dope artists? It doesn't mean that's your top five. Can you give me dope. five dope artists? It doesn't mean that's your top five. Okay. So first and foremost, um, Charles White is like one of my all-time favorites. Okay. Um, I think not only like his work that he did in South LA um, and like with artists from Compton and Watts, but like mm -hmm. just his work as like a sort of like a surrealist um, is really inspiring and, and is kind of like where I want my art to go. Okay. Um, but also artists like Carol Walker also influenced me like when oh, I was a kid. I, I looked up some of her stuff. Yeah. That's dope. And like the cutouts and the way she uses this paper and silhouettes I think is super dope. Yo, fire. I saw that um, they had something I think was at, on, at the Broad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, they did some, and I was like, some of them are like, whoa, what's yeah. that mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me and my uh, my daughters, and she from like, she from the Bay, ain't she? Uh, I think she's from think California, so. though. Yeah. I think she's from California, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Kara Walker's super dope, and, and I love how bold, and I think also the reaction to her work is also part of the art, and kind of just sitting in one of her installation rooms and watching people walk in and out of it is also really interesting to look at. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Kerry James Marshall, I mean, I don't paint in his style or like anything like that, but I do feel like one, he's created like his own sort of like category of art where like, there's like a lot of folks who are influenced by his work too. Okay. Kind of like similar third. to Basquiat. All right. Um, like he didn't even say Basquiat and this five <laughs> dope artists. Continue, continue. Um... I mean, Kahinda Wiley, obviously, like oh, of one of the greatest painters. Mm -hmm. uh, those like huge pieces with They're like huge. the statuesque figures and like the the patterns and the colors. I think is super dope. Mm -hmm. um, how many is that? Like four? That's four, man. That's four. Uh, so you didn't give me. You didn't even give me Diego. Like you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, that, I, like <laughs> I, I mean, mean he was Diego a womanizer, but yeah. come on, bro. Shout out to Diego, I guess. But um, yeah, he was a womanizer. He's also from Guanajuato, where my family's from. Oh, so you're gonna so that, that's your fifth? 
I guess it's no, not. No, it's not my fifth. Ah. Uh, I think my fifth would be, you know, taking it old school to uh, like the Spanish Baroque period. Okay. Um, Francisco de Zurbaran is also like a super dope painter from like the Baroque age. Okay. Um, I gotta look. I gotta look him up. Yeah, but like that old, you know, paintings from like the fifteen, fourteen hundreds. Sounds like, like everybody really, of color. Yeah. Uh, well, he's a Spanish painter. Okay. Um, so he's, he's white, person. but European. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, most of my inspiration does come from like artists of color, specifically black artists. So. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, um, I have another question. I have like a couple more. You know, a little light work. Mm-hmm. If, as you you can see, all the vinyls on the walls, I'm a big music head. I'm big. I started off DJing when I was a kid. I wanted to be a percussionist, all this stuff, right? Like, and um, I ended up being an audio engineer. And then since then, I started writing, started picking up the camera, you know, doing film. It's a lot of a lot of diff- moving parts, mm-hmm. um, especially being a creative, as you know. So, one of the questions is, you get to pick a concert, your own concert. You get to choose three people, right? Dead or alive. Who would perform? You can also give me two DJs. If you're a DJ head, you can put two DJs in between the sets. Mm. And you have to tell me where the location would be, where you would want to see the performance. Mm. Three people only. Let's see who he chooses. Three people? Only three? Only three, dead or alive. That's crazy. Uh, I mean, definitely have Nina Simone headlining. Cause okay, headline. So, so that's that's who's closing the show. Yeah, Nina's closing <laughs> the show, guys. All right. Um, who's and giving us like the her, show? her Black Power um, performance? Who's gonna open it? Man, um, I mean, you know, we could throw some variety in there. I I, I would have what Linda Ronstadt. Uh nah, man, this is a hard question. I need a only baker? three. Uh, there's so many greats though. I know, I know, but you can only choose three. Who's gonna open it? Who's gonna open? I think Sun Ra will open it. Like Sun Ra, okay. As like a way to throw you off. Like you're expecting like something kind of chill and mellow at the beginning, but to have some like. Crazy Boom, orchestra yeah. or the orchestra with like the different sounds and stuff. I think that would be phenomenal. Okay. Okay. So that's the opener, guys. Who is going to be in the middle? And then between them, I think I would have to say Kendrick. Uh, really? Yeah. <laughs> A lot? Yeah. See, this don't even count because he's from Compton. <laughs> right? This don't even count. <laughs> Dang. You know what's crazy? I think uh, like two or three episodes ago, somebody else. I think they chose Kendrick. Really? Yeah, I've never. I've been to one Kendrick concert, one, mm. and it was phenomenal. This is like early in his career, so I'm like yelling at him, <laughs> right? I'm like yelling. I'm like, yo, play cartoons and cereal. It's like my birthday. It was like September, October. Uh, yeah, right? I think you told me this story. Yeah, time. right. Yes, it's a true story. Yeah. Right. So we walking out, and I'm like, man, it's mad whack. And then out of nowhere, like Ali was his DJ at the mm. time, like on the road, but he's his engineer. And I was raised in the sandbox. Yo, I ran back to the <laughs> stage. I was like, yo, it's crazy. This in New York. It was phenomenal, man. That's it was dope. one of the greatest. And I remember like how that made me feel after. Like I was like on a high. And I wasn't the performer, mm. you know what I'm saying? But that's dope. So you got, you know, Sunrai, you got my man Kendrick. And you got Nina closing the show. Mm. That's that's dope. That's fire. Yeah. That's fire. All right. Um, so I would like to know what uh what words of wisdom would you like to tell someone? You know what I mean? Before we, uh, we as we close out, and also the um how to get in contact with you. Those are two two last questions. But before we go, there are two uh there's something I would like to say. All right, yo, make sure y'all check out the phone number below. Monday through Friday, I send off a Bible verse. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you stay positive through the midst of COVID, everything that's happening, suicides, a lot of things going on. So please sign up. Just text Bible below. You know what I'm saying? But let's get to that. Word of wisdom and how to get in contact with you. Well, words of wisdom, uh, I mean, just stay persistent. I mean, you know, I, I think that's probably the best advice that I could give someone. Mm-hmm. Um, and like stay true to your values too I think that's really important as an artist and 
as you grow, you become influenced with like all these different things. And also like with social media, it's like very easy to be influenced either subconsciously or like consciously. Yeah. Um, but I always try to stay grounded to like who you are as a an individual first, because you know, artists are humans. And um yeah, have like a set of values and and just stay persistent. Mm. Yeah. That's fire right there. Um and then just to to get in contact with me, my website, anthonyxyz.com, um, or at Instagram, AnthonyXYZ. Dope, dope, dope. You heard it. You heard it from the best. You know what I'm saying? The one and only Anthony Pittman in the building, painting it up. So definitely you can contact me or look for me at Mixed by Mark, M-I-X-E-D, you know, on, on the gram and everything like that. And I appreciate you. Thank you for watching the latest episode of my creative journey. Peace. <laughs>